Dear Prime Minister Bild, Your Excellency, dear members of the boards, dear faculty and staff, dear families and friends, I present to you the class of 2018. Uh, that, that, that's the spirit. That's good. <laughs> so we have 140 MPP students, 52 MIA graduates, and together they're the largest graduating cohort in the school's history. We also have seven graduates of the school's PhD program in governance. And I remember well that back in 2007, we had just a little over 20 graduates, and now you nearly number 200. And most of you, I'm proud to say, are present here today. Um, taking a closer look at your accomplishments, at your CVs and your backgrounds, I'm really astonished at what you have already achieved. Here are just a few facts about the class of 2018. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. So you, you come from 42 different countries, including for the first time we have graduates from Cambodia, Iraq, and Tunisia. 36 of you completed a dual degree program, and that includes also the first graduates of our joint uh, dual degree with uh, Sciences Po in Paris. 35 graduates spent an exchange semester abroad, then that included our new partners uh, at Waseda University in Japan, the World School of Foreign Affairs, uh, services at Georgetown and the University of British Columbia in Canada. 67 students took part in a professional year and extended internships, and many of those uh, professional years are also now in countries other than, uh, than Germany, and I'm very, very pleased to see the professional year program internationalized. You are indeed a well-educated entrepreneurial and mobile group of talented young people. Uh, you generally speak three to four languages, you hold two degrees, and already studied and volunteered or worked in sometimes even more than three countries. That's remarkable. And we will remember you for many things, but most notably for the following success stories and projects. The Hertie School's Mood Court team, represented by our five MPP graduates, Kerry Hartman, Chris Best, Julian George, Rebecca Siegel and Kasia Nawalyelko from Poland were named one of the three world champions in memorial writing at the Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition. And this is the world's uh, largest moot court competition with participants from over 685 schools in 100 countries. And I really would like to <laughs> recognize that achievement. And I would, I would like to um, ask uh, Professors Thielberg and Dawson to stand up for having done a fantastic job with our students. Now, Mark Becker, uh, MIA student, won the New York City Cyber 1912 Student Challenge together with two of his Georgetown classmates while studying at, at Georgetown in that semester. And we have MPP students, Katerina Bella and Alex Asupi, and they were placed second in public administration innovation competition in Italy. And we had MPP student Patrick Sullivan. He was awarded the 2017 DAD prize in recognition of his academic record and commitment to the Hertie School community. The, yeah. You have been particularly active, I should say, and very engaged in the student clubs and extracurricular activities uh, throughout the academic year. And I would like to mention just a few of the clubs. We have the Gender Equality and Sexuality Club, the Latin American Public Policy Network, the International Relations Club, the Governance Post Team, and the team that organized the European Public Policy 
conference. Congratulations to all of you for what you have done and for the enthusiasm that you bring to the school. In addition, I would also like to uh, remember, or you should remember, the great social events uh, that we have at the school. And I'm reminded of the cabaret last night, which I think was a solid success. But <laughs> however, however, that story about the red sofas is not true. There is a true story behind it, and it, it got nothing to do with political affiliations of faculty members. There was a time when we had black sofas, and there was a time when we had no sofas. And now we have red sofas, and I'll tell you the story behind it. Um, I don't want to tell it now. I tell it when you come to the first alumni reunion next year. <laughs> so that should be an added incentive for you to show up at your, your alma mater. You like, you'll like that story. Yeah. Anyway, I would like to, to thank the MPP MIA student representatives for their tireless effort as well. And today is the student speakers, of course, Patrick Sullivan from the, uh, the MPP graduate and Christina Fiordia, the MIA student from <laughs> Venezuela. And I think during your, your time at the school, you experienced many memorable moments, both inside and outside the school, as we indeed learned at the cabaret last night. And I hope that you look back to your time here at the Hertie School with great fondness and perhaps even a little nostalgia. Because as of today, dear graduates, you will become alumni. You become part of a network that now numbers over 1,200, and it is soon to grow to 2,000. And like many alumni, you will pursue careers in a wide range of fields, be it in governments, international agencies, in the corporate world, or in civil society institutions such as NGOs and foundations. Past records show, as Dean Halleberg will point out to you shortly, that our alumni, and this is to make that day even more pleasant for you because you don't need to worry, um, that found jobs within a few months of graduation and last year, we had a near-perfect placement record. And we at the school are very proud of this, and of course, we stand by to support you as best as we can. <laughs> I'm also delighted that seven PhD students completed their degrees throughout the past year, and my heartfelt congratulations to your achievements, and I know how much work it is for you to complete a PhD, and I also know how much work it is for faculty to make sure that you complete your PhD. <laughs> and, um, so this is the time also to say thank you, and I would like to um, take this occasion to express our heartfelt appreciation uh, to the faculty and to the staff. First of all, <laughs> yeah. So first of all, to the student affairs team who worked so hard to help you get settled in Berlin and make you feel comfortable at the school and in the city. The graduate, yeah. And then we have the graduate programs team and of course, Dean Halleberg, who attended to your academic needs for the last two or three years. We have the career services team who supported you with internships, professional years, and career advice. And of course, the communications team with the impeccable uh, Christina Weitz, uh, Kreitz at the helm, who effortlessly worked to make today's graduation event, as well as many other events throughout the year, a great success. On this occasion, I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to our emeritus professor, Klaus Offer, who is also present here today. He has kindly donated his entire book collection of nearly 4,000 volumes to the Hertie School Library. Since joining the school faculty in 2005, 
Klaus has contributed tirelessly to the development of the school. We are very grateful to him. Current and future students will also greatly benefit from his donation. Klaus, we thank you very much, and I would like you to stand up and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Dear students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, allow me to introduce today's commencement speaker, Karl Bildt. Karl Bildt has served as both Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Sweden. As head of government, he initiated major economic reforms and negotiated and signed the membership agreement with the European Union. Thereafter, he served in high-ranking offices at the European Union and in the United Nations, including as co-chairman of the Dayton Peace Talks in the 1990s. And he became the first high representative in Bosnia and a special envoy of the United Nations to the region then under Secretary General Kofi Annan. Returning as foreign minister of Sweden in 2006, he came to be seen as one of the most prominent and vocal voices in European foreign policy. Currently, Karl Bildt is co-chair of the European Council of Foreign Relations, among, among many other responsibilities. Prime Minister, we're most honored that you have found your way here today, and we would like to thank you for taking the time to come to the Hertie School and for speaking to our graduates. The floor is yours. Thank you. And um, of course, I am deeply honored uh, by uh, the fact that I have been invited to come and speak on this August rotation, although slightly hurt that I was invited to the cabaret yesterday, because that seems to have been the main event. But it was always a great pleasure to come to Berlin after years of dictatorship, of destruction, and of divisions. Berlin is, as you know, emerging as a vibrant European metropolis, generating thoughts that vibrate across Europe and also attracting talent from near and afar. But here in Berlin, history is always very present. Here, it is necessary to think about politics beyond the immediate issues of the day. Here, you can't avoid the broader issues of our time. In August of 1941, some time ago, two gentlemen met on a battle cruiser off the coast of Newfoundland in Canada. The armies of Hitler were still victorious over the plains of Russia and Ukraine. But Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill still had the courage at that difficult time to set out their vision for the world after the victory that by that time was by no means certain. And the Atlantic Charter was indeed a most visionary document. It spoke of a word of no territorial aggrandissement, no territorial changes made against the wishes of the people, self-determination, restoration of self-government to those deprived of it, reduction of trade restrictions, global cooperation to secure better economic and social conditions for all, freedom from fear and want, freedom of the seas, and abandonment of the use of force, as well as disarmament of aggressor nations. And in the years that followed, their victory and the victory of their other allies, this vision was gradually turned into reality. The United Nations was set up, and adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Bretton Woods Institution, the IMF and the World Bank saw the light of the day. The General Agreement of Trades and Tariffs, later the World Trade Organization, was entered into. And a very determined effort was made to turn the enemies of yesterday into the allies of tomorrow and to build networks and structures of alliances and integration, notably here in Europe, 
to secure peace, safeguard freedom, and to foster open societies and open economies. And the results were, when we now look back, remarkable indeed. I was born in a world of 2.5 billion people, the overwhelming majority of whom were living in extreme poverty. And I vividly remember the expectations when I was in your age. The expectation was that they were going to grow and grow in numbers, and they were all going to be desperate, and they were all going to be increasingly poor. It didn't turn out that way. Today we are living in a world of 7.5 billion people, and a rapidly diminishing share of those are living in extreme poverty. The UN sets that figure as well below 10 percent. And developments have been particularly pronounced during the somewhat more than a quarter of a century that has passed since the demise of the Soviet Empire, the liberal economic reforms of India, and the more determined opening up of at least the economy of China. And this, of course, has gone hand in hand with profound developments in science and technology and the spread of this knowledge across the world. Not only have we seen hundreds and hundreds of millions of people lifted out of extreme poverty and the emergence of a global middle class from Shanghai to Sao Paulo, but we have also seen remarkable progress on virtually every other indicator we can think of. Just to mention one, child mortality has been cut in roughly half during this quarter of a century. There have certainly been wars and conflicts during these decades, but we avoided the end of our civilization in a nuclear Armageddon. That was perfectly possible during those years. And overall, the number of conflicts and the number of people dying in conflicts have started to decline. I would argue that this was perhaps the best quarter of a century for mankind ever. For all of its challenges, it was a miraculous period. And a large part of the explanation for that certainly lies in the relative stability made possible by the relative order that can be traced back to those misty days off the coast of Newfoundland in 1941. Trade and economic integration could grow because there were some certainties on the rules that applied, and borders and barriers were gradually reduced. Decolonization gave voice to old nations and new states. The United Nations and its family of organization and institutions, to quote Dag Hammarskjöld, didn't bring us heaven, but at least saved us from hell. In Europe, former enemies came together in a unique endeavor of acquiring real sovereignty by sharing formal powers. And the advantages of open societies and open economies so evident then in this divided sitting country eventually brought the Soviet system crushing down. It was a miraculous period. But now the mood has clearly shifted. Not everywhere, but certainly in those countries that we can describe as Western democracies. There's a talk of a crisis of the global order. There's even sometimes talk of a crisis of democracy in itself. The mood is somber, sometimes even pessimistic, and things are indeed changing. I think there are three mega trends that are affecting us all. The first, that geopolitics is starting to challenge globalization. The second, that the politics of identity has taken over from the politics of ideology. And the third, the industrial age giving way to the digital age. And together, these megatrends are, of course, changing the global order and the tasks ahead. The return of geopolitics is the most obvious of these megatrends. Here, in our Europe, we see the emergence of a revisionist Russia 
openly and explicitly challenging the golden rule of the, golden, of the global order, that borders must never be changed with force. Most of the borders of our Europe have once upon a time been drawn in blood. And if you start to open up the questions of borders again, blood is highly likely to start to flow again. We saw that during the painful years of the wars of the Yugoslav breakup. And since the spring of 2014, more than 10,000 people have been killed in the fighting in the Donbas region. When we stand firm on the principles in that conflict, it is because we have learned the painful lesson of the past in our part of the world. Borders must never be changed with force. The return of geopolitics is, of course, not only the revisionists of Russia, but perhaps even more the rise of China and the profound changes in the global order, the global relationship that this unavoidably will bring in the years and decades ahead. In his large, thick book on China, Henry Kissinger devotes the searching last chapter to trying to answer the question whether the rise of China will unavoidably lead to a clash and a war with the United States, drawing an uncomfortable parallel, of course, with the rise of Germany during the 19th century. And others, notably the US academic Graham Allison, has reminded us of the famous phrase of Thucydides explaining the outbreak of the Peloponnesian Wars 2,400 years ago. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this installed in Sparta that made war inevitable. And these concerns are gradually translated into actual policies. China has set a long-term goal for the growth of its defense spending that is above its goal for overall economic growth, thus setting it on a path to achieve same levels of defense spending as the United States within perhaps two decades. And the new defense doctrine of the United States is very explicit in the changes it sees. We are facing increasing global disorder, characterized by declining the long-standing rules-based international order, creating a security environment more complex and volatile than any we have experienced in recent memory. Interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, is now the primary concern of US national security. Thus, while gradually increased also political integration cooperation was once the dominant feature of the miraculous quarter of a century, to a very large extent facilitated by the dominance and the liberal policies of the United States during this period, it is now state rivalry and globally shifting power relationships that dominate the picture we are thus no longer moving towards greater stability, but instead towards greater instability. While the first megatrend is obviously global, the second is particularly pronounced in our Western democracies. In previous decades, I would argue that our political lives was dominated by the politics of ideology and the politics of hope. There was the belief that a certain set of principles with some sort of certainty would bring our societies forward towards even better conditions and better possibilities for all. Some of this was most certainly misguided. Some of it was outright dangerous. But it was still politics driven by hope and driven by an urge to go forward towards a better future. But the last few decades has seen the gradual decline of the politics of ideology and the rise of the politics of identity. And instead of driven by hope, this politics is often driven by fear. Instead of looking forward, it most often look backwards. 
Donald Trump, who is President of the United States, you might have heard of him, is certainly not the only example of this. We have abundant examples in our own countries. But when Donald Trump spoke about make America great again, he vividly illustrated the change. Ronald Reagan, a previous conservative American president, would never have phrased himself like that. He would have said, make America great, not again, not back towards some fictitious better past, but forward towards an even better future. But this we now see time after time. Make Russia great again, make China great again, make Islam great again. Looking back towards resurrecting a past that alien forces and foreign influences have allegedly deprived our societies of. These, of course, come in slightly different versions. In many of our countries, it is Islam and other immigrants that are portrayed as the mortal dangers. The Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, talks of, I quote, the shipwreck of liberal democracy, quote, end quote and says, quote, that the EU wants to dilute the population of Europe and to replace it, to cast aside our culture, our way of life, and everything that separates and distinguishes us. European, he puts nation against nation. And in the present United States, it also seems like an open global economy is seen as a danger. President Trump, in his inaugural address, said that, quote, we must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries, making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs." End quote. And there are certainly no voices in the Islamic world that see the alleged depravity of the West as a mortal danger to their culture and their society. The politics of identity and fear thus seeks to build new barriers where the politics of ideology and hope sought to dismantle or at least reduce their importance. It is the building of walls between nations and cultures, not bridges, that dominates their thinking. The third megatrend will over time undoubtedly be the most important. Here in Germany, you sometimes hear talk about the fourth industrial revolution I believe that is to misunderstand the issue. I believe we are living in the dawn of the industrial age and in the beginning of the digital age, and that this over time will have as profound implications for our societies as the centuries of the industrial revolution had. The smartphone is just over a decade old. Within five years, it's estimated that 90% of the population of the world will be covered by mobile broadband networks with a capacity equal to or better what we have in Europe today. And that's when the 5G revolution starts setting in with vastly increased capabilities and capacity. When the applications of artificial intelligence starts penetrating everywhere. And when peace and war in cyberspace becomes perhaps the single most important aspect of international security. Those living in England in the early parts of the 19th century probably understood that the Industrial Revolution was a big thing and was going to bring a lot of changes. But I don't think anyone at that time could understand the magnitude of the changes that were going to happen. In relationship between regions, nations and continents, in the social structure of societies, with the political changes this was bound to drive, in the ideas and ideologies that were to dominate during the different phases of the industrial age. And the same, I argue, will happen now. We are entering a period of profound changes. The digital revolution brings enormous promise in very many respects, not least combined with other advances in science and technology. We can detect and combat diseases 
in ways previously unthinkable. We can crack the codes of the remaining mysteries of our time, but the dangers are also there. We see China forging ahead with a determination that is hardly, that is hardly an equal in our societies, with no privacy rules whatsoever, and those access to enormous amounts of data. There's a risk that can't be neglected, that it will dominate the race into artificial intelligence with vast consequences in virtually every respect. And there's little doubt that the regime in Beijing will use these technologies also in seeking to build its own 2084. George Orwell, with his novel 1984, might have been wrong only on the timing. To these three megatrends, could be ad added others. Scientists are telling us that we are into the age of the anthropocene, with the activities and actions of humans changing the very nature of our Earth, with climate change as the most obvious example. And what is truly worrying in this is, of course, that there is now a questioning of the very concept of global order again that the global order needs to be revised and revisited is fairly obvious, with the big change in the power relationships that we see. But there are those now arguing that what we need is less of order, and thus de facto more of disorder. President Putin, in his speech to the Valdai Club two years ago, was very clear, saying we don't accept the rules of today, we can either change them or we operate without them and added that in periods like this, we normally have a series of wars. And looking in the other direction, the new national security strategy of the United States, for the first time, avoids any mention of any international global order. To be contrary, it says that previous policies of engagement and inclusions were based on a premise that mostly was false. Instead, it portrays a word of, I quote, strong, sovereign, and independent nations in fierce competition with each other. It says that, quote, a central continuity in history is the contest for power, end quote, and says that the United States, quote, will compete with all tools of its national power. Words like international order or global community are totally absent. Based on our European historical experience, a situation in which sovereign states fiercely compete with each other in all domains without any agreed framework or rules, for us sounds like an almost certain recipe for confrontation and conflict, indeed, sooner or later for war itself. That is certainly not the intention of those who authored these documents. They simply aim for an America without constraints to win against everyone, everywhere, and every time. And there is little doubt that the United States is still the most powerful country. But neither is there any doubt that power in the world is gradually shifting, and that the relative power even of the United States, and indeed of the combined West, is slowly but certainly declining. Thus, a strategy based on just competition seeking to win everywhere, every time, against everyone, is up against the lesson of history that it will simply not work. And to this, we are increasingly faced with the challenges where the possible solutions lie beyond the possibilities of even the largest sovereign state. We would all be affected by chaos in outer space or in cyberspace. Migration simply can't be handled just by trying to build walls. Climate change and cross-environmental issues can't be ignored. Breakdown of order in sensitive regions creates waves of disorder, sometimes even violence, stretching into our own societies. No one can guarantee that we will never face a serious global pandemic. And I could go on. We need a global order now more than ever. The European Union is and will forever remain a work in progress. Whether it will produce that ever closer union once dreamt of remains to be seen, 
where while the Europe of dreams might have faded recently, the Europe of necessity is clearly on the rise. Time after time, when new issues arise, we see the leaders of the European nations rushing to Brussels for another summit meeting, knowing that on their own they will achieve little, but together they might achieve something and over time perhaps even a solution. And the record certainly speaks in their favour. War in our part of Europe certainly looks impossible. Our economies are intertwined to a depth that the Brits are now fi painfully finding out. The Euro crisis certainly produced a fair share of not entirely successful summit meetings, but the sum of them all took us out of the crisis and back to economic growth. The refugee crisis of 2015 wasn't foreseen. Everything wasn't handled as it should have been. But solutions are still discussed, but gradually new structures are created. And sanctions against Russia, supporting the principle that borders must never be changed with force, are still in place. The record at closer inspection is rather impressive. These and other issues have, during the last decades, so forced the European Union to look primarily inwards, and to some extent that is still the case. But I would argue that it will now be increasingly necessary for the EU to look outward, to see the trends in the world, the dangers to global order, and the urgent necessity to defend the principles of a global order and be an active partner in shaping such an order for the future. It is a tall order. It entails, and it's almost painful to say, sometimes to stand up even to the United States, certainly not in every respect, and hopefully not without, in, with in, and hopefully without endangering the fundamental links across the Atlantic, but certainly on issues where our rights are violated. It entails reaching out to the rest of the world, to democratic India that will soon be the world's most populous country, to Japan, we share many values and principles, to Latin America, Africa, and all other countries. A Europe that not only protects its interests and its citizens, that is obviously important, but also projects its values and principles that must not be seen as less important. Henry Kissinger, to finally return to him, devoted, not the China book, his last, latest book, to the very issue of global order. And he wrote, our age is insistently, at times almost desperately, in pursuit of a concept of global order. Chaos threatens side by side with unprecedented interdependence. Are we, he asked, facing a period in which forces beyond the restraint of any order determine the future. He didn't answer that question. And it's up to you, now leaving your studies and entering the affairs of the world, to find the answer to that question. Thank you. Quintet would like to congratulate the graduating class of 2018. We would like to help you celebrate by playing a short piece, one of our favorites. Franz Danzi, as opposed to his contemporaries Mozart and Haydn, was one of the few composers of the classical period to dedicate himself to the composition of works for wind quintet, which is our kind of ensemble. 
His quintet in G minor is deemed to be his most outstanding work, and we would like to play this very special piece on your very special day.
President Anheuer, Dean Halleberg, Prime Minister Karl Bildt, Ambassador Torsen, Herdy Administration, esteemed professors, parents, family, friends, partners, fellow graduates, thank you all for being here today. Our names are Cristina Siordia and Patrick Sullivan, and we were graciously elected by the student body to speak on behalf of the Herdy Class of 2018. We are truly honored to stand before you representing this remarkable group. We would like to mention the honorary members of the class of 2018 who won't be wearing their shiny scarves today. To our colleagues who finished their degrees at partner institutions, and to those who left for professional year, please know that you were a part of our journey and that you are close to our hearts. To our friends who only joined us this year from Paris, Milan, or Syracuse, and to those who came back from professional year, it feels as though you were with us all along. We think you made the right choice. This is probably not how the saying goes, but it really takes a village to complete a master's degree. <laughs> to every person in the administration who answered one of our questions, to our professors who challenged us and inspired us, to every one of our colleagues who calmed our anxieties when they said, don't worry, I haven't really started that paper either, <laughs> to our families who are proud and supportive, even though they don't really understand what it is that we studied, and to our partners and friends, near and far, thank you for sharing our small victories and huge worries. Thank you for being our village. The Hergy class of 2018 met for its first beverage at Gendarmenmark, probably a beer on a sunny September afternoon. As the bottle caps flew up, popped open with the most unlikely of objects, the questions too started popping, such as, are you MPP or MIA? And how good is your German? <laughs> as Berlin got colder and our days at Hertie grew longer, study space was in short supply, but questions were not. How is your data analysis going? You put in that much effort and got an 85? And finally, is it president or dean on hire? <laughs> on the last one, the jury is still out. Our Herty years have been marked by a plethora of shared experiences. Some were academic, like thesis-induced psychosis. Others were culinary, like Mumbai masala lunches. And because das ist Berlin, there were the parties. From Marie Antoinette soirees to Berlin 3030, this cohort shared some memorable moments in the iconic Berlin night. And of course, we had email gate. <laughs> While finding out what works is a major theme in the policy world, our management blessed us with a series of insights, a series of don'ts, if you will, of how exactly not to handle a situation like this. <laughs> We're still not sure where our emails are, <laughs> but this didn't keep us from handing in our theses. We faced the snafu and won just one of our many victories. Just as President Anheyer mentioned earlier, as we look back on the journey of the class of 2018, one cannot feel but feel amazed by its many accomplishments. This class had, and it need to be said again, a renowned moot court team that earned several accolades at the international level a running club that provided an outlet to relieve stress while raising thousands of euros to help refugees across Germany. <laughs> and a dedicated student government that has made great strides in reforming its organizational structure to give students a better voice at the school. Student-led events featured topics ranging from promoting gender equality in the workplace, discussions with ambassadors, and rethinking the field of economics. 
We held conferences surrounding pertinent global issues across several European cities in Europe. We can feel proud of the fact that we truly, <laughs> that we truly took advantage of this experience for all that it had to offer. A degree is just one of the things we have achieved over these last two or three years. But perhaps the most valuable thing we achieved was forming meaningful, long-lasting relationships with outstanding people. Other high-end institutions pride themselves on creating an atmosphere of fierce competition among their students. But we believe that the fact that we've experienced a learning environment that promotes cooperation instead makes us more mindful of others and ultimately better public servants. This environment fosters feelings of true admiration towards those we call friends. The Herdy student body is genuinely filled with kind-hearted individuals. One look at the Facebook group will show that there's never a shortage of housing recommendations, free food alerts, or insights on a vapor. Someone is always ready to spread some hearty love. We should stand among our colleagues and our friends with great pride and gratitude. I sure do. The Herdy experience is greatly enriched by the many backgrounds and nationalities that each of the members of the communities brings to the table. Often we're surprised of how different we can be and how little we know about even our neighbors. We should not, however, misinterpret these important differences that exist among us to mean that we are the most diverse or inclusive of communities. Herdy is still a bubble, an enviable learning environment, no doubt, but also an incomplete one. Herdy is a place where the like-minded have the privilege to engage in interesting discussions about solutions they one day hope to implement for others, but also, on occasion, a place that fails to engage in discussions about problems that lie outside the normal distribution. And by normal, I mean OECD. This, too, was an ever-present element of our experience. A reflection upon our hurdy years would be incomplete if we didn't also consider these struggles and missing pieces. Some of us arrived for the first time at a place where we didn't speak the language and navigated the impossible, snail mail-driven world of German bureaucracy armed with nothing but Google Translate and determination. <laughs> we have colleagues who moved their families halfway across the world and ended up questioning their decision to do so once they realized that most of what they would learn would be very hard to apply directly back home. We had a real life experience in conflict management, which forced us to confront our prejudices and realize how very far many of us still are from accepting and much less understanding those who we believe to be different. Many of us had to watch from a distance as catastrophes, some natural, but many more man-made, unfolded back home. And all we could do was bombard social media with news and crowdfunding campaigns. But even on the days when the weather was a little too cold and the club matzo from Herr Furman just wasn't strong enough to keep us going, we had one unwavering source of support and inspiration as to what it truly means to pick yourself up and rise from adversity. We obviously had one another, but we also had Berlin. Berlin is a testament to the power of convictions. No rational choice model can explain how this crazy city is the capital of a country famous for its efficiency and productivity. <laughs> Berlin reminds us that there's more to human decisions that we can read in Stata outputs. The unquantifiables mean something, hard as some may try to strip them away from the model specification. This city gets its magic from its authenticity, its unique understanding of freedom and diversity and its struggle to resist the one-size-fits-all mentality. These are vital lessons in policymaking that we learned outside the walls of Friedrichstrasse 180. We would surely be a better, better off if we tried to be more like Berlin. As recent graduates, we already have so much in common with the Hauptstadt. We, too, are poor but sexy. As Berlin is not so much a city as it is a piece of the world, we would also like to take a few steps back and reflect upon this world, the world that we'll be stepping out to, and idealists that we are, trying to change. 
We are indeed a unique point in history when times are changing. It is certainly a unique time to be leaving this school with a master's degree in public policy and international affairs. Across many countries, trust in governments to do what is right is at an all-time low. Many of the main foundational bedrocks of international institutions have been called into question. In some of our home countries, my own for one, a marketing of checks and balances between different branches of government have raised major concerns over the concentration of power in the hands of a single executive. In others, overwhelming concentration of wealth and a disproportionate political power that comes with it. In some, basic freedoms have been severely curtailed. Other trends have involved an increasingly divisive political rhetoric, often coupled by attacks on those at the margins of their respective societies. Amongst our cohort, we have people who have lived through times of economic and political turmoil, times of violence, even times of war. While the world always operates in an unstable equilibrium to some extent, we view this crux of time in our shared history as a particularly vital one. How fitting, then, that this cohort has attended a policy school in Berlin, of all places, to complete their master's degrees. We stand here today a bit shy of the 30-year anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, a symbol of divisiveness, oppression, and a discouragement of communication and productive dialogue. Walls still exist in our world today, both physically, mentally, and in the many ways that things like equality education, access to decent drinking water, and even the freedom from physical harm can be blocked. As students of a policy school, a governance school, it is our responsibility to not only prevent the further production or expansion of these walls, but also to use the tools and skills that we have learned during our time at Herdy to do our best to break down the walls that still extend in the way of making this world the place we believe it can be. Walls can be broken down in so many ways that go beyond physically tearing them down with one's own hands. Although, if necessary, we should do that too. At a micro level, we've talked about some of the walls that exist within this institution. It is important for us as Herdy alumni, but also to those in the hall here who remain as students, to continue to advocate for what we would like this institution to become over the next 10 years. Outside of the walls of Herdy, we face unprecedented challenges as a human race. Some of these are collective and wide-reaching. Others can be found at as local as the neighborhood level. Yet if there's anything we've learned that is applicable to beginning to find solutions to these problems, as you work to shape tomorrow, remember the lessons you learned from the people with whom you tried to understand today. Consider the following few. Do your best to learn from those who are different. Never stop asking questions. Always strive to be of service to others. Honor the opportunities and the education that you've received. And always try to share the hashtag love. A major component of the Herty mission statement involves encouraging responsible stewardship of the common good. Whether we end up as, at an NGO, a ministry, or even in the private sector, we all share this duty. The onus is on us, class of 2018, as we move forward in this interesting experience that we know is life. Our time here is up, and our responsibilities in this realm moving forward are by no means minuscule. But we have great faith in your drive, your abilities, and most importantly, where your hearts are. Let's go out there and get to it. Thank you very much for your time, and congratulations, Herty Class of 2018. Good afternoon. Well, President Anheyer, as well as Christina Zeordia and Patrick Sullivan, thanks several people. I think, however, we need to recognize one more. Helmut Anheyer, this is the last time you will be here as president of the Herdy School at one of our graduation ceremonies. I think it's important that we thank you for all of you with what you have done here at the Herdy School. 
Could you please stand up? All right, I have a lot of names to read soon, but I do have three brief messages for the class of 2018. First, I suspect that many of you starting on Monday are gonna be looking for a job. Those chips and Asta beers you got last night at the cabaret may be your fare for the next few weeks. <laughs> Pre Pres uh, uh, President Anheyer mentioned the statistics, however, in terms of how well you will do, and I did check yesterday with career development, I just want to reassure you, about 80% of you will have a job in the next few months. And by the time we get out to 90%, I mean out to nine months, it'll be more than 90% of you. And so my first message to you is, don't worry, you will be happy. <laughs> now I'd also like to remind you that you will be a Hertian for the rest of your life. I'd like to follow on our previous speakers to ask you to find a way to contribute back to your school. To give you two examples, there are two alumni who are now in New Delhi who will be sponsoring a professional year student next fall under GIZ. I know of another former student of ours who, after his graduation day here, started to work in a German ministry. And this past semester, he taught a project course where he brought his ministry his employer, and his life experiences back to the Heritage School. So I can state that if you support your school, there's a second message for you. Don't worry, Hertie will be happy. <laughs> Finally, think about service beyond your school to your community. I fear that ignorance is increasing in policymaking circles around the world, and especially among those who happen now to win office, not just run for office, and who are appointed to prominent positions. I'd like to quote one of my favorite former American presidents. He said, quote, it's not cool not to know what you're talking about. <laughs> you do know what you're talking about. Your education provides you with the knowledge, skills, and insight to combat this ignorance. When politicians insist on building walls, you tell them you were educated in Berlin where people tear down those walls. This gets to my third and final message. If you contribute actively to your communities, I can say, don't worry, the world will be, well, I can't guarantee it'll be happy, but at least you'll make the world a better place. It is now time to move to my favorite part of the ceremony. President Anheyer, will you please come to the stage over here? I'd like to begin with our PhD program, then I'll move on to our MPP and MIA program. This is the fourth year where we have PhD agrees to award. In this year's class, there are seven students who completed their PhDs. We have a representative from the current cohort whom I'd like to ask on stage. He is Nicolas Scherer. Nicolas, could you please come up? His thesis is entitled, Ensuring Against, oh, sorry. I should say, President Onheyer is also his thesis advisor. <laughs> the title of his thesis was, Ensuring Against Climate Change, a Political Analysis of the Emergence of Regional Catastrophe Insurance Facilities. It was also done with Professor Arne Westad. So Nicholas, congratulations. Okay, it is now time to introduce the class of 2018. Eduardo Ascomanedo, please come to the stage. Kelly Vanessa Acuna.
Naz Ali. Lorenzo Arioli. Victoria Zara Angel. Camila Araujo de Schipper. Rafaela Laura Teresa Arino. Mark Armstrong. Ruslan Azadov. Alex Azupi. Maryam Ayachi. Erika Branda Septien. Bruce Barbie Rubio. Ashley Marie Bartlett. Sadaf Basharat. Mark Becker. Leonard Theodore Johannes Becker. Katharina Bella. Julia Katharina Berg. Melissa Gabrielle Berkowitz. Christina Best. Amir Boloyazad. Luke Bonanno. Ariel Lee Bolton. Rachel Bowen. Tabia Bredenitz. Helen Carlina Burmeister. Jose Imer Campos. Valentina Caracci. Federico Cadenas. Christina Chang. Christina Seodia Toro. Lucia Chizmazovia. Rachel Chok. Ricardo Konagji. Athena Cook. Sarah Elizabeth Cooper. Juanita Corridor. Hugo Cuello. Francesco Cusimano. Beatrice Dalolli. Sarah Delea. Christina Jenny Delgado. George Delreux. Stephanie Ann Dimitri. Diletta DiMarco. Carlo Di Donay. Sean Donovan. Francisca Trautz. Thiago Elliot Suarez. Maria Belen Espinosa Orego. Gaia Falki. Sarah Isabel Fassbinder. 
Deborah Ferreira, Fritz Leopold Finner, Damien Freiherr von Büsselager, Georg Freise, James Robert Fritz, Frank Evert Garrison, Julian Alexander Georg, Dominique Gola, Victoria Zimek, Fabian Hafner, Thor Hagemann, Kerry Hartmann, Jochen Fabian Heidrich, Manuel Maximilian Helmanschik, Carmen Hennig, Paola Sofia Herrera Espiel, Ara Sophie Heronimus, Anna Lena Hohmann, Nadina Alexandra Jakob, Christoph Inyachuk, Stefan Ivanovic, Roberto Ludwig Japon Treffler, Shuvujib Josh, Sadam Yabali, Lars Jerentrup, Ilya Kaniuhof, Marius Katt. Ibrahim Faisal Köran, David Koenka, Anna Alessia Kubli Sobrino, Constanza Landini, Julian Richard Lang, Marco Laretti. Kimberly Lu, Kian Tin Long Lo, Jennifer Natasha Lobo, Bastian Lotz, Jan Lucas, Carl Mackinson. Maud Magatai, Marti. Carolina Matamoros Ferro. Amy Marie McHugh. Benedict Ernst Meng. Leonor Merck. Kira Maria Messing. Nicholas Montanari Chapman, Moran Azizanora Moran, Andre Tenorio Morao, Matthias Reber Migan, Keisha Nalaveto. Sweta Nawani, Kilian Stefan Pascal Nedelic, Bonita No, Lucas Christopher Nusser, Alexander Ochenden. 
Sonia Ong. Eban Osejo Biamil. Anna Pelegatta. Max Pastor Pfeiffer. Laura Phillips. Oscar Ivan Pineda Diaz. Luisa Plasborg. Sophia Pogsheba. Tristan Powell. Waishali Prasad. Leopold Pressler. Jeffrey Pugh. Eugenio Puga Ividals. Fritz Philipp Putama. Josephine Kiok. Rashni Rajiv. Finn Karsten Rautenstrauch. Kathleen Redmond. Nicholas Michael Reschen. Victoria Riquelme Beaufort. Stephanie Begit Rogers. Stefan Rofing. Ekaterina Wostomashvili. Liad Breutfarb. Sven Rudolf. Jonathan Rummel. Ricardo Miguel Sales Rivakova. Rahul Sambat Kumar. Giacomo Santangelo. Akira Sasaki. Caitlin Grace Saslo. Bentley Shikov. Tessa Schneider. Konstantin Michael Schottenhammer. Dana Schran. Michael Schuch. Philipp Schwedfeger. An Sophie Louise Schulen Teuten. Lillian Christina Seffer. Rebecca Sigal. Charles Thomas George Seymour. Jakob Maximilian Slama. Joy Prima Summa Sundrum. Tarek Alexander Sorg. Clara Alexandra Stinshof. Patrick Sullivan. Kevin Benny Thrillerin. Hannah Trice. Maxime Paul Henri Tribelet. Daniela Trujillo. Matteo Valori. Ruben Peter van Zuerst. Emily Vandenberg. Brett Allen van der Bosch. 
Natasha Andreina Velasco Rodriguez. Bask Favat. Rosalie Agnes Alice Madeleine van Boch Galau. Paul van Salich. John Rushi. Celio Wang. Elena Wasserhess. Sophie Wellen. Johannes Christopher Welsch. Jasmine Whaley. Christopher Winchell. Akrom Jakob. Ko Liang Ivan Tiang. I introduce to you again the class of 2018. So we would like to um, suggest the following, if um, I can ask you to um, uh, calm down a moment. Uh, what we will do now, um, after we have to do something very, very important that is very dear to my heart, because we have to thank Mark Hallerberg, because Halle Mark Hallerberg has uh, acted as dean for the last year, and I think he just did a terrific job as being uh, dean of programs. And if you sometimes ask why so many things that I heard you school, function quite well. It's because of people like Mark Hallerberg. And I think he really, we owe him a thank. Where, where are you, Mark? Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, so this is what's going to happen now. We uh, would like to uh, ask Prime Minister Carl Bildt to join us on stage. We will have a group photo with the uh, class of 2018, and then uh, all the family and friends and partners have the opportunity to come closer and take pictures from here. After that, we will slowly move outside the building, and you see, you remember those stairs, and we will take more photos on, on the steps leading down to Gendarme, Mark, right? And uh, after that, we will probably linger there for a few moments or for a few minutes. Uh, you are all invited uh, to come to the Hertie School for a reception. Right? And it uh, leaves me just now to, to thank you all for coming, and I think this has been a very splendid occasion and a very nice celebration of these young people's uh, achievements uh, this afternoon, and I look forward to catching up with you at the reception in a little while. Thank you so much. And we now have the uh, group photo, and the photograph, yeah, the, the photographer is already in stage, and I think we uh, need to have Carl built up here. And, ah, there. Yeah, and then we take the photos. <laughs> 